you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? Alice said. That depends a good deal on where you want to get to, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. So long as I get somewhere, Alice added. Oh, you're sure to do that, said the cat, if you only walk long enough. Some people who like fairy tales might recognize that little exchange between Cheshire Cat and Alice. Well, the narrative is from Lewis Carroll's book, Alice in Wonderland. The paraphrase that we can sum up from such a conversation is simply, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Any road. So what does that really mean? It means, literally, without direction, without destination, without a goal, without a purpose, without vision. How can we pick or choose a road? How can we aim in one direction and plot a course to wherever there is? Well, you see the dilemma in that. You really can't. An individual without vision can't really see the goalpost ahead, the finish line. An individual without vision has a harder time finding the motivation to push through life's problems oftentimes. An individual or a collective body of people where there's no vision, no purpose, the people tend to get distracted to go different directions, fail to accomplish their mission, fail to work together as a team, and they scatter. That's, that's life. That's what happens in humanity. No need to turn, but a quick, short passage in Proverbs 29, verse 18, simply says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29, verse 18. And the NIV, I'm sorry, the New King James Version, that's from the King James original, but this is the New King James Version where there is no revelation. The people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. Within the pages of the Old Testament, there's a journal of a one particular personality that I'm going to focus on today. A man who stands out as a person of vision, in a most outstanding way. His name is Nehemiah. Nehemiah was the man that God chose to lead his countrymen through a very difficult time. Very well-known author and lecturer John Maxwell says in his book titled Leadership Bible, The Leadership Bible, he notes that this story is one of the most remarkable stories of leadership ever recorded. That according to John Maxwell. And I'll quote a couple of times in my message today from John Maxwell. He has written many books on leadership. When God began working through Nehemiah, he served to rally his countrymen to do something that would amaze the surrounding nations and it would bring glory back to God after it was missing for a long time, and it was to rebuild something that was broken. Nehemiah brought comfort to God's people in a time of great need. He brought vision. He brought a focus. He rallied the people to work together, and he did some amazing things through a powerful example of his leadership. And no matter what yours and my position and calling in this life is, you might be a parent, a supervisor, a coach, a spiritual leader, a disciple of Jesus Christ, which we all are. We can all learn from Nehemiah's example. And so in this relatively short book we're going to focus on today, it's only 13 chapters long, the book of Nehemiah, there are a number of lessons on godly leadership that are relevant for us today. So I'd like to share just five short lessons with you from this man of God, Nehemiah. And these five lessons come just from his first visit to Jerusalem. 
where he shared God's vision and he brought the people who were scattered and going different ways and only caring about their own things at the time that he came into Jerusalem. And he brought them into one accord to rebuild the broken wall of Jerusalem. What was done was, again, something that was going to amaze the surrounding nations. The title today, Rebuilding the Broken Places. Rebuilding the Broken Places. Let me give you a little bit of background. God has told, had told his people Israel centuries earlier, obey the covenant that you made with me, and you'll live long and prosper in the land in which I'm giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Disobey my laws, and you will be, uh, you'll have testing, you'll suffer, and you'll eventually be taken into captivity. Well, it did happen, didn't it? It happened first to the northern nation of Israel, then it happened to Judah to the south about 130, 135 years after. The Babylonians came and conquered the uh, the people of Judah and many from the tribe of Benjamin, carried most of them off to Babylon, which was about 500 or 600 miles away, a long distance in those days. Then God promised after 70 years of bitter captivity and humiliation, Another world-ruling empire was going to come and overtake the Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians. And they suddenly became, came on the world scene, and here we have King Cyrus the Great conquering Babylon. Within the 70 years that Babylon was the highest and the, the most powerful nation known at the time, and Cyrus decrees in 538 B.C. that the Jewish captivity is now over, they can return to their homeland precisely as God had predicted. And God had predicted long before that Cyrus, by name, was going to be the messenger to bring that news to his people, the Jews. We move forward to the year 445 B.C. This is Nehemiah's moment. It came almost 100 years after King Cyrus made that first decree for the Jews to, to be able to leave Persia now it's Persia, it was Babylon, and then returned back to their homeland if they wished to. Well, a number of them stayed, but there were three different waves of Jews that did come back in different times. And so three different waves did decide to come back to Judah, but again, it was a 100 years later when Nehemiah had his moment that God called upon him or put it in his heart, as he puts in his own words. He put, God put it in Nehemiah's heart to do something to really stir up the people to action and to bring glory back to Jerusalem and bring glory to God. Please turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 1. Let's begin looking at these five lessons that we can learn from this man of vision, Nehemiah. Nehemiah 1 and verse 1, first of all, Paul the apostle says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11, that examples such as we're going to look at today were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. The Old Testament is so full of stories and illustrations and examples that are for our admonition. Uh, we're still, if you're at Nehemiah 1 verse 1, a little more background at this moment. Nehemiah was the cupbearer for King Artaxerxes at this time. He was a Persian king. But he's more than just a butler. Holman's Bible Dictionary explains the cupbearer holds a very distinguished position of great responsibility. It's an office of trust, and by tasting the king's wine and food, he stands between life and death for the king if someone tries to poison the king. And so a great deal of trust has to be put in whoever the king decides is his cupbearer. And so Nehemiah was both a Jew and a captive serving a Gentile king as his cupbearer. It was an unusual honor that spoke to his strong character. In fact, when you read the narrative in the book of Nehemiah, the discussion that, or the discussions 
that Nehemiah has with King Artaxerxes, you see almost a friendship or a bond of some sort where there's a very deep trust between them if it's not a friendship. Let's begin reading. Nehemiah 1, verses 1 through 3, the words of Nehemiah, the son of uh, Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chislev, which would be November, December time frame, in the 20th year of the Persian king Artaxerxes. As I was in Shushan, the citadel, if you have an old King James, it says Susa, Shushan, Susa, same thing. It is the royal city of Persia. It is the capital, it is where the king resided. Verse 2 that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with the men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. So here, Nehemiah is asking some other fellow Jews that might know some more history since Nehemiah has been in the king's court, perhaps much of his life. And uh, here again, it's been 100 years since Cyrus first told the Jews they could start to go back to to Jerusalem. And they said to me, verse 3, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall <coughs> of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So it's a dismal report that these Jews bring back from their homeland. Again, it's 445 B.C., about 140 years have passed since Babylon came in and destroyed Jerusalem and burned down the temple, and the people were taken into captivity. Nehemiah is serving as, at the winter residence of King Artaxerxes, again, about 500, 600 miles away from his homeland in Judah. Attempts to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem had been a very frustrating task. It had its failures. The Jews were discouraged years earlier when some of the enemies of Judah that are pointed out in Ezra chapter 4 and chapter 7 uh, were, were hindering the progress of the Jews of rebuilding the wall. And so very little sovereignty could be sought in an open city. In those days, if you didn't have a walled city, you were vulnerable to attacks by anyone. And so Jerusalem, the capital city of the Jews, of Judah, was, was very vulnerable. And very few people actually lived in the city, Nehemiah says in chapter 11. So Nehemiah was told about Jerusalem's outer wall still being in ruins a, a century, almost a century from the time the first group of Jews returned from Babylon or from Persia. We get the sense that Nehemiah has never been to Jerusalem. He hears these reports. He's eager to hear what's going on. But it doesn't look like he himself has ever been there. But his heart is there. His heart and his longing to go back to the home of his ancestors. Because that was God's heritage for Judah. And he knew the prophecies that it was God's will that the Jews should return and rebuild. He knew the prophecies. So Nehemiah begins coming up with a plan. What's the very first step he takes? Well, the answer comes in the next verse, verse 4. We're in Nehemiah 1, verse 4. So it was. When I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. What can we take away from this? Very simply, Nehemiah is taking the problem directly to God. It's not even his personal problem. He's in a fine, comfortable position serving under King Artaxerxes in Persia, but his heart is not there. You see that his heart is longing for his countrymen in Jerusalem. So what does he do? In this visionary prayer, he humbles himself before God and he takes this problem directly to God. And let's look at the pattern of the prayer. We go to verse five. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Next, in this visionary prayer, we see how he exalts God. 
Verse 6, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. You see the humility. And they're not even his personal sins. It's called intercessory prayer. He's making intercession for the rest of the Jews who he knows the history of what led to the captivity, and he's asking and petitioning God to forgive and restore. Next in the visionary prayer, he continues with his intercession for others. Verses 8 and 9. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you are cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. So that happened once in history. It will happen again. There is another time when Israelites, the modern-day nations of Israel, will be scattered to the four winds, the four corners under heaven, the four quarters of the earth, different ways you'll see in the scriptures that that's mentioned, into all nations and lands. And yet God will gather them back. And he will know which ones he's gathering back. There'll be a, a remarkable time when that happens in the future after Christ returns. Next, he reviews his own trust in God's promises and his mercies. Verse 11, let's skip to verse 11. Oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day. I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, the Persian king. Now we can see here that other godly people are praying along with Nehemiah, the same prayer. They're enjoined with Nehemiah and praying for God's mercy and God's intervention. Then and only then is Nehemiah ready to make his appeal to King Artaxerxes. He has prepared himself in prayer. He's humbled himself from fasting. He has asked others to join him in prayer and he has shown God the promises he made. And he says, God, don't you remember that you did this and said this about your people? And so now he's ready. So this one prayer of Nehemiah is just one of 12 prayers in the book. So we can see here what sincere prayer can do. This is still lesson number one. Prayer helps God's vision and God's revelation mature in us. When we're involved with prayer to God and we're studying his word, it helps God's word and his revelation and his vision mature in us. When we ask in prayer for something, it helps us align our desires with God's will for us. So a part of it is knowing God's will. As Paul says, Find out what the will of God is. We could be wishing or praying wishful prayers that don't have any basis in, in God's promises whatsoever if we don't know what God's will is. So that helps us to align our desires with God's will in prayer. Prayer pre uh, prepares us for whatever the task is that we're facing ahead of us. It helps us to be prepared for a challenge ahead, something that, that is undaunting or something that looks very difficult, something that we say, I just don't have the strength or the finances or the, the ability or the endurance to do such and such, or the will. God can help us with those things. Now, prayer also motivates God to work quietly behind the scenes on those areas that we have petitioned and asked him for. He starts working and preparing a way for his answers to be revealed. And we as human beings don't always see that. Sometimes we, we pray for something for a long period of time and, and sometimes suddenly God can open up an avenue or an opportunity or an open door that we just couldn't see. That's how God works at times. You can see God putting many, many things in place when we're asking for God's help in matters that have 
great bearing and great weight and the things that might even include other people and relationships and connections with others that God says, I'm, I'm weaving through this request and I'm, I'm going to do something that you might be stunned and marvel at, but give me time and it's God's time, God's time. He, he needs to do it in his time to align things that will work to his glory and to our benefit. This is a wonderful part about prayer, that we're, we stay vigilant and persist in prayer. And prayer helps us to stay watchful and vigilant because when God begins to move in our lives, we see it and we know it when we've been praying for something. Prayer helps us to not miss an important opportunities for personal growth, for opportunities of service, for being an example, things that come our way. Our prayer life helps us to be prepared in those things. Paul says, and I won't turn, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Our prayers should always begin with thankfulness and then our, let our petitions be known to God. And Paul says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. So lesson one, Nehemiah shows in his example how to first take a serious or a heavy problem directly to God to petition his help before we attempt to tackle it. That was lesson one. Now, we're still in chapter 11. I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 11. Nehemiah adds for the record, I was the king's cupbearer. We've described already what it, what's, what it is. Uh, it was a man who stood close to the king. He had to have high integrity, loyalty. He had to be cultured, knowledgeable, able to advise the king when asked. And there was this a position of influence that Nehemiah had with the king. And it would have been built up over years of service. The cup bearer in some uh, cases was thought to be more like a prime minister and master of ceremonies kind of rolled into one, according to one, uh, uh, one Bible commentary. Because Nehemiah had access to the king. He was in a position of high influence. And it was to his advantage to ask for what he was going to ask for. It was to his advantage. No, here's something very interesting about the whole story of the book of Nehemiah. And we're only looking at a section at the beginning of it. There's something interesting about the story as we walk through it. Nehemiah himself was not a prophet. He became governor of Judah, but he was cupbearer to the king. He was not a prophet. There's no record that he received a direct message from God that we know of, no voice, no dreams, no visions. Just that he says later that God put it in his heart to perform this task. Sometimes we think of our, our own lives, oh, which we wish we had God's direct answers, that God would tell me the answer to what I'm asking, and I'll have this dream or this vision, or uh, maybe not. Maybe you say, that that's a little lofty for me. I, I don't necessarily do that, but I'm just thinking in terms of we go through our daily lives, and we know that God has given us a, a manual on how to live. And he didn't leave out important parts that we're supposed to struggle and strive to figure out on our own. No, God gave us a manual for living a successful life in our Bibles. And as Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong would say, it's a complete book. It's, a, it's complete. God designed it that way. Now, he might add to it uh, after, after the book of Acts. He, he would say sometimes, God may just add, continue writing the book of Acts after Christ returns, but for now we have a complete manual on how to live and, and be successful and to glorify God. And so we don't try to find out things through mystical means or, or 
or oracles. Uh, that this is something that Nehemiah didn't have either. He didn't have that. And he was a man of faith, though, that was assigned a role of governor over the rubble and waste that he would go down and see for himself. No recorded dramatic showy miracles happened when he got to, uh, to Judah, to Jerusalem. Just visionary leadership, rallying cooperation, and a lot of hard work. But what came out of that was amazing. So the key here is Nehemiah saw a need. He had a very deep concern and compassion for his countrymen. And what happened next? Well, lesson two, Nehemiah shows us how he worked his plan. He worked his plan. So what, how does he do this? From Chislev, again, that's November, December on the uh, Babylonian calendar, I believe, he talks to his brother up until Nisan, March, April, when he brings the request to the king. More than three months had passed, and perhaps four months. Nehemiah and his friends waited on God daily, asking him to provide a way to open a door. Let's read Nehemiah 2, verses 1 through 5. Nehemiah 2, verses 1 through 5. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, again, this is three or four months later, after he received the news, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was set before him, that he took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad, since you have not been sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. We don't know if several days passed or this was just one event where suddenly the king saw Nehemiah in a most sad, remorseful appearance that he'd ever seen before. So he says, and this is a narrative he writes, he says, so I became dread, uh, dreadfully afraid and I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my faith face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs lies waste and its gates are burning with fire? burned with fire. Verse 4, then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the Lord God of heaven. Now you notice he didn't just blurt out the request. It gives an appearance that he gave it a little more time. He went away and prayed again before coming back with his request. This was working his plan. This was having something solid to present to King Artaxerxes. Not to say, okay, I'm thinking of this, and uh, maybe tomorrow I'll, t I'll, I'll think of something else. No, he came back with a plan. So he goes back to prayer again, and then he shares. Nehemiah was going to carefully formulate his plan, and God was going to be included in that plan. Verse 5, let's continue. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. He asks that he might go to Jerusalem. The walls had crumbled. The gates burned. The morale was low. It had been a hundred years since Cyrus had first told the Jews that they could start returning and rebuild their homeland, rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple. The daunting task of rebuilding three miles of stone wall that surrounded the ruined city was something that the people already living there says it's impossible. We've had too many obstacles. It's just too hard. And, but God was being dishonored as long as Jerusalem lay waste. God was being dishonored. And so God wanted to see this change. This was the place where God's presence had been, where his his uh, words were spoken and the experience of love and mercy. People would come and flock to Jerusalem while it was still existing. These blessings had not returned even after the 70 years of captivity. So Nehemiah wanted to do something about it with God's help. And God put him as the right man in the right place. He had the vision to see the problem. He had the vision to come up with solutions. And because he had vision to build Hope in the people. It's very important to see that he came and he brought hope. He brought hope in others that he led and influenced. 
What about you and me? Sometimes we have much, much smaller spheres of influence in our lives. Our friends, our family, our co-workers, our associates. Uh, sometimes are, are there broken places in our personal lives that might need mending from time to time where we can go boldly before God's throne of grace and ask for help in a time of need to rebuild broken places? It's a rhetorical question. All of us at times have hardships with relationships, whether it's family or, or, or friends or neighbors even, and we wonder what can we do about it? Something might be bothering us about the way things are, where things are headed in our personal lives, within our power to change. These are things that might be within our power to change. Do we ask the hard questions when that happens? Are there areas of our lives that we could be making a stronger case in prayer for God's intervention with greater fervency and greater perseverance? Well, yes. The rhetorical question is answered yes. Are there relationship problems in, in our families or among friends that might need some healthy fence mending, as they say, fence mending? Are there inter, inter, in, individuals that could use our intercessory prayer? Well, we all know in God's church is a very important part of our training and our calling is to pray for others for their struggles and their needs and their trials. So when we go to God and ask for his vision and for his help and our self-examination, something very healthy and constructive happens in our lives. Something very important happens for us. See, Nehemiah first saw the need. He felt the need in his heart. And he had deep compassion. Again, he was moved by the need he had for his fellow countrymen. He refused to eat for a time. He devoted himself to heartfelt prayer. And then he presents his plan to the king. Let's continue reading verse 6 from chapter 2, verse 6. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, How long will your journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set a time for him. Verse 7. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors in the region beyond the river that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. He granted everything. King Artaxerxes didn't hold back. He said, okay, I'm going to look at your, your wish list here. I'm going to X this out. I'll give you half of that. No, he gave it all to him. Verse 9, then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of his army and horsemen with, with him. So he sent an entourage of protective soldiers so that the journey would be safe. And you see now, it was a 500 plus mile journey. And he sent men and equipment and, and people had to uh, tote beams all the way down to Jerusalem, wherever they were coming from, and, uh, and royal letters to the governors in the region he would pass through so they wouldn't be hindered. He opened the door, God opened the door, it was amazing. Skip to verse 11, Nehemiah 2 verse 11. He comes into Jerusalem and he's going to start surveying all the damage. So I came to Jerusalem. I was there three days. I rose in the night and a few men with me. I told nobody what my God had put in my heart to do in Jerusalem. Nor was there any animal with me except the one in which I rode. Oh, he's on a donkey or something. And I went out by night through the valley gate of the serpent well and the refuse gate, and I viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates which were burned by fire. And then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal under me to pass. So he gets off and uh, he walks. And so he got up, went up in the night by the valley and he viewed the wall, then he turned back and entered by the valley gate. Now, I don't know all the... Uh, all, all, all the structure of all the gates surround Jerusalem, but he, he looked at all of them. He went around the circumference of the city of Jerusalem, looked at all these gates and all the burned down and crumbled wall. 
Verse 16, the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and others who did the work. Now, one analysis of that is that possibly he needed to see these things firsthand and also not to arouse any suspicion or jealousy of what he was doing. He comes from a faraway place, and he's going to be their governor. Can you imagine that there's some uh, resistance to uh, authority whenever somebody new and different and somebody they have no idea who he is just comes on the scene? Well, God is still going to be working with him, but it's, it's just interesting to see that that's human nature. That happens. Now, there's this issue... Step back with me for a moment. Why did it take a hundred years so far to rebuild the wall around the city and to start rebuilding the city and cleaning up all the rubble, the waste, the refuse? Why? Well, outside pressures, I've already mentioned for, for one, there were these, um, these enemies of the Jews that were resisting and making it very difficult. But there's another issue. There's this book, uh, I'll just make one quote out of it was by a Robert Cooper PhD 2006 copyright titled get out of your own way get out of your own way the author Robert K Cooper cites a study done of fortune 500 companies the study showed that 30 percent of companies on the fortune 500 list in the year 2000 no longer exist these are Fortune 500, top-notch, prosperous countries, uh, com <laughs> companies. 30% of them did no longer exist in the year 2000. And 40% of the 1979 list of Fortune 500 companies were also gone. The study indicated that excellent companies rarely sustain excellence because of complacency complacency here's a quote from the book when companies corner a segment of the market that is profitable companies often stop investing in research and development they start relying on what worked well in the past they ignore indicators that things are actually changing in which they always are in the financial world, in the world of uh, commodities and economics, things are constantly changing, more so than ever and ever, ever before. And this, uh, this was part of the book. And so that was an example in the business world. What about a spiritual example? It's very clear to see the Jews took a hundred years because of perhaps lack of leadership, because their enemies were also pressuring them, but because of complacency. George Barna of the Barna Research Group, in his analysis of another event that happened in our country on 9-11-2001, all of us remember the famous and infamous day of 9-11, the attacks on the Twin Towers in New York and the Pentagon and so forth, where uh, the analysis by George Barna was, as he says, I was among those who fully expected to see an intense spiritual reaction to the terrorist attacks. The fact that we saw no lasting impact from the most significant act of war against our country on our own soil says something about the spiritual complacency of the American public. And I agree. The American public has a short memory and they go back to business as usual, life as normal, and they forget the blessings, and they forget who their defender is, God. They forget these things. So many people in our society are becoming more and more complacent, but a person with vision sees a need, feels a need, has compassion, and shares the need with God, and as resources permit, fulfills a need. Now, I didn't write that. I copied that, okay? But that speaks to Nehemiah. That speaks to Nehemiah. Then came the time to present the plan. Let's go to verse 17, verses 17 and 18. We're in chapter 4. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste? Now, remember, Nehemiah is down in Jerusalem. He's talking to the elders, the leaders, the priests, 
and, 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 and other nobles. He says, Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be an, a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God which had been good upon me and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. And so they said, all right, let's rise up and build. So he's got a buy-in here, which is wonderful. As a leader, someone who's just come on the scene that they didn't know before, he gets them to buy in that God is working with him and that he has the influence he needs. He's got the documents. He was cupbearer to the king of Persia. He's got some, he's, he's, he's got some cred, okay? He's got some credibility. Then they set their hands to do this good work. So, lesson number two. Nehemiah shows how he planned his work and he worked his plan. And he presented it to the people in a way that they would buy in with it. Now, there's a very positive buy-in here. Let's go to lesson three. Again, lesson two was he had a plan and he sold it or he prepared it so well that he presented it to the leadership of Jerusalem. Lesson number three will show how he handled criticism. Is there something very important that will happen to any leader? And this is something I... I, I kind of took to heart a few years back when I was studying more of John Maxwell's books on leadership. He would say that every leader will be criticized and criticism will change the leader. That's got good and bad parts to it. It's a very interesting dynamic. We'll talk a little more about this. Verse three, now Tobiah the Ammonite now, he was servant or secretary to Sanballat, was beside him, was beside Sanballat, and he said, hmm, whatever they build, see, word gets over to the enemies of the Jews, whatever they build, if even a fox goes up upon it, he'll break down their stone wall. This is psychological warfare to try to discourage the Jews, to try to, uh, to present um, a false narrative, a, 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 a very discouraging words, and to criticize and condemn and, and to tear down any morale that the Jews are starting to just, just starting to have at this time. So here's the political power struggle. What does Nehemiah do at the time? Verse 4 of chapter 4. Uh, am I in chapter 4? I'm not in chapter 4 anymore. You see? Oh, yes, it is. Verse 4, okay. Of chapter 4, he shows that he prays again. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads. Now, I'll pause here. It is what we call imprecatory prayer. We don't pray this as Christians. Uh, beat down our enemies, slaughter them, kill them all, burn them up, and all that. We don't do that, but they did that in the Old Testament. And it was something that you see on occasion. You see King David doing this. You see other prophets of God doing it. Let's start again. Hear, O our God, for we're despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads. Give them as plunder into a hand of the land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity. Do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders." Now, God listens to those prayers, but we, we know a different way because Jesus Christ taught us a different way. But in the Old Testament, you see imprecatory prayer more often. Now, the experience of Nehemiah is repeated in the history of God's people in all ages and all times. Those who share God's truth will be criticized. They will stir up criticism and condemnation from those who don't know God and don't know God's truth. This is just axiomatic. This is what happens since leaving the Garden of Eden. Contempt and derision are painful, but Jesus Christ told his disciples ahead of time that's going to happen. It's going to happen. If they persecuted him, they will persecute you and me. God's faithful ones will be criticized. It is Satan's strategy to demoralize, to discourage, to break down, to turn people away from God's work that God has called us to do. So that's been going on from time immemorial. 
In John, Mel, John Maxwell's Leadership Bible, he says, accept the reality that some criticism will come to a person who leads and that the criticism will change the leader. Matthew 5, verse 11, I won't turn. This is Jesus Christ speaking. Matthew 5, verse 11, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And what do we do when that happens to us personally? We pray for them. We pray for them. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 12, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. That takes character. That takes a certain temperance to develop to be able to do that. And that is our calling. When criticized, this is also part of the leadership training from John Maxwell's books. He says, when criticized, listen carefully to whatever is being said, but don't believe everything at face value. This is when any one of us is, comes under criticism from someone else wherever, uh, in whatever situation you're in. Take time to see if fruits back up what is being said. And then this again, John Maxwell mostly over the years has dealt with uh, corporate and church organizational leadership training and structure. So when he says, if you're criticized, don't believe everything at face value. Take time to see if fruits back it up. See if it's only one or two people criticizing or if it's a large number of people criticizing for the same thing. That will help, you know, make us all understand that there's, there's more than just one person with a kind of a, a skewed idea of uh, he doesn't know better or whatever. Proverbs 18 verse 17 speaks to this. It says, the first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. There's always perhaps a little more to fill in the gaps in any kind of a situation. Find out, discover, learn, listen, be patient, ask questions. And then John Maxwell says, if mistakes were made, then apologize for them. If you cannot remedy the situation, then put the matter completely in God's hands. I uh, have a very dear, my wife and I have a very dear deacon friend who would often say to us in conversations, it's in God's hands. It's in God's hands. If there's a, it's a conflict, there's a, there's a problem, there's a, a difficulty, it's in God's hands. And that's a wonderful short statement just to memorize and to say, and really mean it though, it's in God's hands. Pro, uh, Psalm 55 verse 22. Psalm 55 verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. We're in chapter 4, verse 6. So Nehemiah prayed about this. Verse 6, so we built the wall. I love it. It just jumps right into it. So we built the wall. And the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Barnes Notes Commentary says about this part of the, uh, the story that at least 37 separate work parties were orchestrated at once. Right there was the goal and the singular purpose. Build the wall. Get it built after 100 years. So this was the main thing Nehemiah wanted to accomplish, to rebuild the broken places. And once that was done, he knew and God knew there would be renewed confidence in God, there would be a huge success, great motivation to build the momentum to continue to rebuild the other parts of the city and to repopulate the city. Remember, it was in chapter 11, Nehemiah said, very few people were in the city confines of Jerusalem. Verse 7, more conflict is coming. Verse 7, now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the wall of Jerusalem was being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry. 
And all of them conspired to come together and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Verse 9, nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God, and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Lesson three was, we showed, it showed us how Nehemiah handled criticism when it was not fair. In his case, it was not fair. And he prayed to God for support. Lesson number four out of five, much more brief. Much more beef. Lesson number four shows us how he motivated other people when the morale was so low. It shows us how Nehemiah motivated other people when the morale of the city was so low. Let's skip to chapter 4, verse 10. Chapter 4, verse 10, here again, one could see that the morale was low. People were afraid of their enemies. Nehemiah quickly came up with a plan to present a visible display of strength, which was appropriate for that day to wield swords and bows and spears. But he also reminded the people of, of God's power to protect them. Let's see how that mixed together here. Verse 10, then the people of Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing and there's so much rubbish that we're not able to build the wall. And our adversaries said, they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause their work to cease. So they were going to plan a secret attack and infiltrate and then start killing the Jews and break down the morale that they had. That was the plan of their enemies. Verse 12, so it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came that they told us 10 times, from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. In other words, woe is me. They're coming to hurt us, destroy us. They're not going to let us finish this. It was mentioned by Mr. Dubois, the beginning of the millennium, how there will be such destruction and, and, and it'll look like cities are laid waste and it'll be a time such as God will need people with a sense of vision and purpose and enthusiasm to stir up morale again, the same way to rebuild the cities. I could see this happening in a massive scale when God's future leaders, spirit leaders, are there on the scene to help people and encourage them to start rebuilding and it will take probably a couple hundred years, some people have estimated, before many cities and many parts of the world are brought back to beauty uh, because of all the destruction that will, that will be uh, coming before. Verse 13. Here again is Nehemiah with a plan. Verse 13. Therefore I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings. I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Now, we might think in our minds, well, that seems like a dichotomy. It seems like a, it's a conflict of interest. You've got spears and swords and bows in your hand, and you're waiting on God, and you're hoping for God's deliverance. We do not fight, as Paul said, with weapons of war. We fight against principles and powers that are on a spiritual level. And we do not take up guns to fight and bows and arrows like they did. But he also includes, don't forget the Lord great and awesome and fight for your brethren. Verse 15, it happened. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. So they got the victory. God gave them the victory. The enemies were scared away. The enemies, maybe just by the appearance of all these people on the wall with their, with their uh, uh, you know, they're slapping mud onto bricks with one hand and they've got a sword in the other hand, it's kind of like, uh-oh, they, they heard about our plot, and they backed off. 
we don't, again, wrestle against flesh and blood, but we put on the whole armor of God, as Paul shows in Ephesians 6, verse 12. So lesson four shows us how Nehemiah motivated others when morale was low. Finally, lesson number five out of five. Sometimes in leadership, there is a need to make sacrifices for a good cause. Sometimes there's a need to make sacrifices for a good cause. Nehemiah 5, verse 14. See how Nehemiah handled these things where he had the privileges, but he didn't take advantage of them. Nehemiah 5, verses 14 through 19. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year, uh, so for 13 years, 12 years, I'm sorry, uh, of King Artaxerxes, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions, but the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people, took away from them bread and wine, besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Indeed, I also continued to work on this wall, and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for the work. What a positive influence that would have been for Nehemiah and his servants to not take advantage of the people like former governors, former politicians there in Jerusalem did. We see that going on in our world today. So many take advantage of uh, the comfortable positions they find themselves in and, and they become career politicians rather than serving people in some cases, maybe many cases, many, many cases. So Nehemiah stayed above that and his influence would have become that much stronger as a result. Verse 17, and at my table were 150 Jews and rulers besides those who came to us from the nations around us. Now that that which was prepared daily was one ox and six choice sheep. Also fowl were prepared for me and once every 10 days in abundance, all kinds of wine. Yet in spite of all this, I did not demand the governor's provisions because the bondage was heavy upon this people. Verse 19, remember me, my God, for good, according to all I've done for this people. So he saw what we could see in a parable in the New Testament as kind of a pearl of great price for Nehemiah. He wanted to give up all that he had to come and serve this people in Judah and serve God and help rebuild the wall. This was his main goal, and he accomplished it. Lesson number five was that sometimes there is a need to make sacrifices for a good cause. The conclusion today takes us to the final passage, Nehemiah 6, verses 15 and 16. Nehemiah 6, verses 15 and 16. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul, which is August, September time frame, in 52 days. And it happened when all of our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things, they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by our God. You remember me saying that there were no flashy miracles, no prophets sent at that period of time that we know of, um, but that Ezra and Nehemiah were possibly um, com uh, contemporaries, but that's another story. But here we see just a lot of hard work, a lot of motivational uh, speaking and encouraging people, and a lot of prayer for God's intervention. And they perceived this work was done by our God. This is how God has brought success for his people and glory to himself through history and through the history of God's true church. Nehemiah's story is a demonstration of true leadership, a task that looked insurmountable and daunting and that stalled for nearly 100 years was accomplished in 52 days. We saw lesson number one, Nehemiah taking a problem directly to God. 
We saw lesson two when he saw he, we saw how he planned his work and he worked his plan. We saw how he handled criticism and opposition when it was not fair, and he put it back in God's hands. We saw in lesson four how he motivated others when the morale was low, and we saw in lesson number five how sometimes there is a need to sacrifice for the cause of something good and something bigger than the individual, and also that brought a lot of positive influence back to Nehemiah. Now, numerous other lessons could be shared, but I decided to focus on those five. And we see diligent leadership skills in this story of Nehemiah. The success attending Nehemiah's efforts shows us what vision and prayer and faith and wise and zealous action could accomplish, rebuilding the broken places. And so you and I serve the same living God that helped them then and with God's vision and purpose in our personal lives and with God's help, there's no limit to what God can do for us personally in rebuilding the broken places.